In the Russian media, criticism of the war effort was invisible. It's now creeping into the coverage. Russian history isn't what it used to be. We look at the official efforts to scrub it clean. And Iran's supreme leader offers and tweets his response to the continuing demonstrations there. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we provide explanatory journalism about journalism and the global news media. We begin with a narrative that is shifting in Russia. Since the Kremlin's annexation of four provinces in eastern Ukraine, its forces have suffered setbacks. Some Russian voices on the airwaves and online have grown more critical, not of Vladimir Putin, that comes with consequences, but of the Russian military. These aren't anti-war voices. For the most part, those have been silenced. The pro-war Putin faithful are now grappling with defeats they never expected to see. Russian troops in retreat from towns like Liman inside the annexation zone. The generals taking the flak are getting it from some public figures who carry considerable clout online. Loyalists on usually subservient state television channels are echoing that. And military bloggers, go-to sources for Russians trying to find more authentic reporting from the battlefield, are painting a picture that's every bit as bleak. The angle of this story that has not drawn enough attention? The nuclear one. And Putin's refusal to take that option off the table. Our starting point this week is Moscow. If you're a Russian in a state-controlled news studio these days, you were advised to choose your words very carefully. Обстановка на фронте очень тяжелая, при этом люди, понимающие, говорят, что это только начало в том смысле. Even someone like Margarita Semanyan, the head of the state-owned news outlet RT, needed reminding of that after she appeared on another channel, Rossiya One. The topic: Russia's unilateral annexation on September 30th of parts of eastern Ukraine and its military's humiliating retreat from some of that same territory the very next day. It was the kind of analysis that will get you called out. Спецоперации на Украине. Займитесь внутренней цензурой. If you're a political player and you're online, like the oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin or Ramzan Kadyrov, Vladimir Putin's man in Chechnya, you tend to have more leeway, but not that much. So you rip the underlings and go after Putin's generals, calling them unfit to lead on the battlefield. There's a saying in Russian, Tsar Hiroshi, Bayeri Plahi, Tsar is good, boyars are bad, Tsar, boyars are, Tsar is fossils. So the idea is that you do not criticize Tsar, you criticize uh, people who are in charge of implementing his decisions. It's a relatively significant moment because we uh, have not seen criticism coming from such high-ranking people like Kadir. Chechen leader Ramzan Khadyrov and uh, Prigozhin, who is an oligarchical ally of Putin's, criticized the war effort in scathing terms. They're not alone. They're important because Khadyrov has sent troops from Chechnya to uh, the Ukraine. And Prigozhin is important because he runs this mercenary group called the Wagner Group. They represent a larger community of nationalists, of right-wing nationalists, who want to take the gloves off. The retreats um, are going down very badly. Most analysts are agreed that Ramzan Kadyrov did not write the criticism of the army on his very popular Telegram channel. The sort of language was being used did not give off particularly strong Kadyrov vibes. Different groups that are close to the Kremlin vying to um, place responsibility on other groups, on, on groups with whom um, perhaps they have rivalries. And that's really what we're seeing now. 
Rumblings of Russian dissent provide glimpses into how media censorship there works and when it does not. Controlling the terminology is the easy part. Don't call it a war when the Kremlin says it's a special military operation. Don't call the latest conscription order for an extra 300,000 Russians a mobilization. It's a partial mobilization. The problem occurs when facts on the ground change too quickly for the authorities to keep up and the official guidance is late in coming. Media outlets don't know what kind of terminology they can get away with, how accurate they can afford to be. If we compare what, uh, what uh, state propaganda was uh, telling about uh, this war at the beginning in March, uh, and, and now these are two totally different wars, because, because back then... The Ukrainian nation, oppressed by the Nazi government, would definitely um, support uh, Russian troops and, uh, and Russian control. And when it didn't happen, the propaganda has to explain all the defeats and the retreats. The союзные силы сейчас усиливают оборону. Штурмовые группы дают жесткий отпор националистам. And why the military operation that was expected to to take like three, four days already lasts more than half a year, and there is no end in sight. Russians searching for more reliable war reporting can no longer rely on alternative media outlets. They have been brought to heel. Millions have turned to the messaging app Telegram and military bloggers embedded with Russian forces who offer more factual news from the front. With followings in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes more, they publish detailed information, maps of troop movements when allowed. They blog with a pro-war perspective and are distinctly unhappy with the news they are reporting. Some of them are also calling for military heads to roll. And again, we start to see this looking for who is to blame. Sladkov, one of the most popular, was talking about how you know arrests need to be made because the military are clearly not adhering to the constitution. The accusations that are coming out remind one of, of even darker times in Russia's history and the need for sort of purging. That said, these people, they are more extreme than the government, so they shouldn't be misunderstood as that's the direction of the Kremlin, but they, but they are influential. People understand that they can't, can't, can't get any reliable information from war propaganda on television. You've got this uh, group of people who uh, have very nationalist views, but at least they have uh, give you access to some information about what's going on on the ground. Uh, and because of this uh, access, uh, they became relatively influential. Some of the Telegram channels they run, they have uh, millions of subscribers because people want to get access to, to the information. The opposition to this war is not from those who are anti-war. They have been repressed sufficiently in the demonstrations, the arrests. It is now coming from a far right and a far, far right, an extremist nationalist right, but that is a very important opposition, and they have their own apps, they have their own media, they have their own newsletters. It's an important trend to watch as the war goes badly. Of all the angles in the Ukraine story the Russian media have come up short on, none is bigger than the nuclear one. President Putin's repeated threats that that option is on the table should Russian territory come under attack was described by one Moscow paper as unbelievable. Its editorial argued that to allow in words the possibility of a nuclear conflict is a sure step towards allowing it in reality. But that was the exception. Then again, why would Russian news channels be concerned by something that some of their own anchors have been suggesting for months now, with the apparent blessing of the Kremlin? Why do we want to Ukraine or Germany? Britain is. 
О, корень зла. Russian media does a lot of uh, saber rattling, nuclear saber rattling at the at the moment, and that's a controlled and uh, a narrative uh, effort being built inside the Kremlin. Of course, that's Putin trying to send the message to the West that he would not uh, back off, that this is not a bluff. His message has to be sort of backed by the whole propaganda apparatus. And this question, where are we all heading, is. Uh, is, is, in, is in the air. The talk of nuclear weapons of any kind is horrifying. There is a normalization of talk both inside Russia and on our TV screens and in our media. Uh, the normalization is reckless, insane, and it has intensified in terms of those around Putin who are perhaps more extreme than Putin, who see quicker use of it whereas Putin may be using it for negotiations. This war has entered a very, very dangerous arena, and that, I think, has to be reckoned with. We'll get back to Russia shortly, but first, Iran, where the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has finally broken his silence on the protests that began there three weeks ago. Flo Phillips now with the details. Richard, this past Monday, Ayatollah Khamenei delivered a speech that was designed both for his domestic and international audience. It was broadcast live in Iran and key parts were then tweeted out. They were Khamenei's first comments on the death of Masa Amini. She was arrested by the so-called morality police for not wearing a hijab the way the law dictates and reportedly died while in their custody, setting off the protests. Hamane called it a tragic incident, but said that the demonstrations were, quote, schemes designed by the US, the fake Zionist regime, and some treasonous Iranians abroad. As evidence of foreign meddling, Hamane pointed to the messages of support from Western politicians and even Western media coverage of the protests, reporting that he said was openly supportive and unlike the coverage given to protests elsewhere. <laughs> که رسانه های جمعی وابسته به سرمایهداری آمریکا سابقه داره که اعلان کنند که ما فلان سخت افزار و فلان نرم افزار اینترنتی رو در اختیار Hamenei was talking about a statement issued by the Biden White House on Iran's jamming of internet access. It said, quote, the U.S. is making it easier for Iranians to access the internet via secure outside platforms and services. Videos, images and messages posted online by Iranians, many of which have shown women removing and burning the hijab in public, have provided a sense of what is happening there. The U.S., which has pushed for maintaining sanctions against Iran, has chosen this story, this moment, to ease some of them, to help keep Iranians online. Thanks, Flo. Back to Russia and Ukraine, a story that beyond the fighting on the battlefield pits one version of history against another. The Russian president provided a glimpse into his thinking last year when the Kremlin published an essay in Vladimir Putin's name in which he argued that Russians and Ukrainians are of the same Slavic nation. He did it again, just prior to the invasion. It is all part of a new historical discourse, one that emphasizes Russia's status as a great power and mythologizes the country's past. Among the victims of that rewrite are Russians themselves, those who contest the erasure of history. That includes one organization, Memorial, that has spent years researching and remembering the victims of political repression in what was the Soviet Union. Suddenly, it has found itself on the wrong side of the law. It's been shut down. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now from Moscow in a report filmed the month before the invasion on the battle over historical memory in Russia. December 28, 2021. An abysmal year for free expression in Russia comes to a fitting conclusion with the judge ordering the closure of the country's oldest human rights organization. <laughs> 
For more than 30 years, Memorial had preserved records and artifacts from Joseph Stalin's Great Purge, when show trials, mass arrests and executions touched every level of society. Memorial's Human Rights Center, which has also been shut down, kept track of political prisoners in Russia today, assembling a vast online database of repression in Russia. What happened in court last year was that the state exposed itself. The prosecutor spun the idea that Memorial does not paint the history of our country in a positive light, that it demonizes the USSR as a terrorist state. When we started Memorial, the true scale of the repression was absolutely hidden. Memorial did a lot to open up the archives. What is happening today is not just a regression, it is a crime against citizens of Russia, because citizens have the right to know their history. The main function of Memorial was to gather evidence of the national tragedy our country experienced. My grandfather, Mark Mikhailovich Alberts, was shot on November the 1st, 1937. More than 1,000 people like him were shot the same day. They wanted to force him to admit that he was a Trotskyist, even though there wasn't a single shred of evidence to support that. This was the memory gathered and researched by a memorial. Memorial. Memorial started functioning as a political organization, and that really is a pity. I remember Memorial when it was created at the end of the 1980s as an organization aiming to help the relatives of people who were imprisoned and to remember them. Nowadays it has become an anti-Russian political organization. Mikhail Mirkov's argument echoes that of the state, which has grown more defensive of Russia's historical legacy. When Memorial first surfaced in the late 1980s, things were different. Citizens were seeking out the truth about Soviet state terror, and relatively little stood in their way. In 1990, members of Memorial installed this, the Solovetsky Stone, here in Moscow, to honor victims of political repression in Soviet Russia. It was a period of glasnost, openness and transparency, when Russians were learning about the atrocities committed under Joseph Stalin. The decision to put it here in Lubyanka Square was significant. We're right across the road from what was the KGB's headquarters, now home to the FSB, the Federal Security Services. But 30 years on, some of those dark chapters from Russia's past are being erased. History is being rewritten. When Vladimir Putin came to power, practically all the archives were closed. The people who exercise power in Russia today are former KGB officers or members of the Foreign Intelligence and the FSB. They are ideological supporters of the KGB and the USSR. They want to pretend that there was a short period of repression. But in reality, the whole governance system of the Soviet state was based on violence. For the current Russian leadership, the Kremlin, history is a tool for introducing certain myths into people's minds. What we see today is the revenge of the state security agencies, which were in retreat in the early 1990s. The state no longer wants to know the truth about itself, it builds its own history and arranges it to fit its ideological purposes. A campaign to sanctify Russia's war heroes is playing out in popular culture and in public space. The government has championed patriotic films that lionize the military and affirm its use of force. Many of these state-funded blockbusters center on Stalin's leadership in what is known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War. Moscow is filled with tributes to historical figures, patriots who ensured the survival of the state. It's where you can find pop-up propaganda showcasing Russia's military arsenal. Some of these murals are sponsored by historical associations run by senior officials close to the president, including this one 
opposite the Kremlin. It was commissioned by the Russian Military Historical Society, where Mikhail Mikhov is scientific director. The victory of the Soviet army in the Second World War has a crucial role in how Russians self-identify. We have to hold on to some constants, such as our victories during the Patriotic War of 1812, the First World War or the Great Patriotic War. These allow us to feel self-sufficient in this world. We can say to other nations, we gave you freedom. We live in a world that was created by the Soviet Union in 1945. Missing from that narrative are inconvenient periods of history, like August 1939, when Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler agreed to a non-aggression pact arguably paving the way for a world war that started one week later. Over time, Stalin's legacy, once so discredited, has been rehabilitated. In 2019, a survey by the Levada Center found 70% of Russians thought he had played a positive role in Russian history. People are constantly told that without Stalin, the Russians would not have won the war. Stalin. Putin has nothing else to offer Russian citizens. He cannot offer them wealth and prosperity. And that is why he is only offering them myths of some great periods in history. Having shaped a grand historical narrative about Russia's place in the world, Vladimir Putin now wants to protect it. A new national security strategy, signed by Putin in 2021, says traditional Russian values and historical memory are under attack and must be defended. Before Russia invaded Ukraine this week, Putin once more revealed his obsession with righting past wrongs by questioning Ukraine's historical right to exist. Стали строить свою государственность на отрицании всего, что нас объединяет. Стремились исковеркать сознание, историческую память миллионов людей. Я бы никогда не поверил. I would never have believed it 30 years ago if someone would have told me all this would begin to repeat itself. We have not learned any worthy lessons from history. Any state, any community of people often live with myths about the past, but all myth-making begins with a set of values. What is valuable for the group of people now leading Russia? To remain in power forever, to consume, to occupy. We can see that now with the revanchist speech on Ukraine and to convince everyone that the state is an absolutely sacred object which cannot be encroached on in any way. And finally, analyzing the words and the messaging of world leaders can be taxing what gets said, the tone, the delivery. But have you ever paid attention to the way they walk? Those few moments when a president or a prime minister heads for the cameras can reveal a thing or two that their speeches do not. Stefan Leons Hersberger is a German comedian and actor. His impression of the way various global leaders walk is all over TikTok these days. See if you can spot the leader before the reveal. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post.